hey, whoever's out there. Um, I got sent this one. So, so uh, they said I wasn't going to get mad. So uh, judging by the by the title, it's not really clickbaity. And uh, it's a uh, mix down online, how to hook up external preamps to your interface. Do you really need one? Uh, so sounds promising, could be infuriating. And uh, I don't really know this channel. I think I might have seen something by it before, but uh, oh, here you go. You got a beard. Super original. I like that his shirt doesn't say anything. That's like that old uh, BMX joke, right? Where you have the, the totally blank clothes, they're just colored, no logos, and you're like, I'm totally sold out. But of course, uh, there's a band practicing in the background, and uh, just like last time, I'm lacing up a wheel. So. Let's see how this goes and uh, we'll see what we got here. Let's check how we can hook up uh, these preamps to an interface like this one. But the question is, do you really need external preamps for your recordings or is... Uh, I'm right there with you, dude. That's a good question. And uh, the answer for anybody who's been following along and actually testing these things is uh, not really. I mean, if you need something that has a lot more gain, um, it's kind of starting to look like you're not even getting that much less noise out of the really expensive ones anymore. But you can always go to my page, pipelineaudio.net, and you can see actual tests of actual mic preamps from like El Cheapos to really expensive ones. And uh, kind of answers that question for you. But let's, let's see what he has to say. But the question is, do you really need external preamps for your recordings? Or is working with the preamps on your audio interface good enough? Hey, what's going on? Chris Salim here from Mixdown Online. Now, before we jump in, you can check out my free workshop on how to build the perfect mix template so we can speed up your mixing workflow. The link is down below. Okay, now in this video, what I'm gonna talk to you about is how you can connect preamps like these to an audio interface like this one, which is an entry-level interface. This one is the Audient uh, ID14 MK2 that I actually reviewed not too long ago. And then I'm gonna show you my thoughts on if it's really a need to work and record with external preamps. But first, let's look at what we have here. Now, on my side, I have my Vintec 473. Those are four preamps. So first, what you need to do uh, if you wanna connect an external preamp to an interface is to look at the back of the preamp and look for the output that you have. Like on the back of the preamp, you will have a, um, a microphone input and also an output. That can be an XLR output or a quarter inch output. I have both on my side with this unit. I have an XLR balanced output and also an unbalanced quarter inch output. On the audio interface side, when we're recording, we are dealing with three different types of input levels. We have the microphone level input, which is the level that comes out of a microphone before it gets amplified. And this runs between minus 60 dBU to minus 40 dBU. We also have instrument level input. Um, that is the level of an instrument, like an electric guitar, an electric bass, and that will run at around a minus 20 dBU. And lastly, we have the line level input, which runs at plus four dBU. And this comes from a signal processing gear or pro gear like preamps, for example. So that's why on uh, an interface like this one, uh, we have a, an instrument input, okay, which is gonna manage the, uh, the instrument level inputs for electric guitars, bass guitars, and so on. And we also have at the back of this one, which is probably the same for a lot of those interfaces, we have combo inputs, which are like these, you know, where you can connect an XLR cable and also a TRS cable or a quarter inch cable. So those are combo inputs. You can find them on a bunch of different interfaces like the Evo 8 that I have right here. I also have them on my AXR4 right at the back here and also on the URRT4, which also has combo inputs, okay? So the cool thing, you know what? Uh, this guy's actually making sense. Who who sent me this one? Man, this is actually good. Um, I'm, I'm <laughs> I don't know what I've got supposed to be complaining about. This is pretty cool. I like this guy. I have to watch more of his videos. 
cool thing about combo jacks is that if not specified, they will detect what kind of cable is actually connected to the jacks and they will adapt the input level according to what is plugged in, you know? So if you plug in a, uh, an XLR cable, it's gonna go into a mic level input. And if you connect a quarter inch TRS cable, it's gonna switch to a line input. So what I do on my side to connect external preamps like these, I use a female XLR to TRS, okay? A cable to just, you know, connect that to the back and straight in the combo input that I have here. And this way the interface will detect that I'm using a TRS cable and will switch that input to a line level input. And very okay, important- Just so you know, not not all of these will do that. That's that's kind of the bummer. Like sometimes you think it's gonna and uh, it's not. So uh, be sure, you know, it's actually it's kind of hard to test, but um, you should be able to, or it should say, but half the time it doesn't, so to do is to bring the level of the preamp to zero. The preamp is going to be managed by, you know, the level of the external preamp and not the one on the interface. But again, you need to make sure that the input you're going to use to connect your external preamp is supporting line level, okay? Uh, because some don't. Let me show you. For example, I have my URRT4 and it's, uh, you can see it right uh, on top, you know, the first two preamps will not support line level. They will support IZ, which is basically an instrument level input and also an XLR input. Now, input three and four will support line level, okay? So this is where I would, in this case, uh, using the URRT4, this is where I would connect my external preamp, straight on input three and four. Or at the back, I also have input five and six that are also line level inputs, okay? So those also are good to connect an external preamp. So just make sure uh, that uh, your the input you're using to connect the, uh, the gear supports line level, or else the signal coming into your interface is gonna be way too loud. Because on paper, I could just use this, you know, this XLR cable connected to the XLR output straight on an XLR input on the interface, but my signal is going to be way too loud and I'm going to have to bring the level of the preamp very low, okay? And this is kind of defining the purpose because, you know, you're using an external preamp probably because you love the tone and sound of that preamp. So if you keep... I'd say probably because you think you have, uh, you love the sound of that preamp. If your preamp has a sound, I'm sorry. Um, remember how many tests we've actually done on this and how few times people actually get this stuff right? I, I don't think your preamp has a sound. You might think your preamp has a sound. Your, your preamp probably doesn't have a sound. Um, I know that that strains all my credibility and nobody should ever listen to me again for saying that, but uh, somebody's measured that and somebody's found that that's true. Keep that preamp very low you're not going to get the full tone that the preamp can give you so again one option is to use a next so there okay so now we're getting into it sorry um you know we, we have this non-linear idea but um when we did these tests it, it turned out that these things are pretty damn linear especially the the back in the day ones where you didn't really have a an output control if you're taking the direct out so I, I don't believe this. Let's uh, let's just let this go. I, I'm I'm actually I'm putting together a set of BSD rims which use uh, the the crossover lace, you know. So it's uh, I'm having a very hard time. I, I laced one set wrong before. Um, in fact, let me see if I can turn my uh, let's turn the camera on here. I'll show you what I'm working on. Uh, actually, I don't know if that's gonna work or not. Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe. There we go. So this is a, uh, uh, if I don't get it in the right place, then I won't be able to get the valve, the, uh, you know, the tire pump in there. So it always drives me nuts if I do this wrong, but you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. So we'll see. Our female to male TRS cable, which looks like this. And this is a balanced cable. Okay. So the difference between the balance and an unbalanced cable. If you look at those two quarter inch connectors, the balanced cable has two rings on the connector, on the quarter inch connector, opposed to the unbalanced cable. So that's why we call this version of a quarter inch cable, a TRS cable, which stands for tip ring and sleeve. And on a lot of preamps, you also have the option 
on using a quarter inch output. So avoid using unbalanced cables to connect external preamps to an audio interface, unless otherwise specified, like it is in my case with the Vintec 473. I love sparking water. Like bubbly is like the best. That is the best around, I'm telling you. Not sponsored. So now the big question, do you need to work and record with external preamps? The answer is simple, it depends, you know? There's nothing wrong with the preamps found on an interface like this one, okay? Uh, you can record high quality music uh, using only the preamps out of this interface, in my opinion anyways. So it has nothing to do with the quality of the music in a way. Uh, first, you know, if you need more than four preamps, like this one has four preamps, my AXR4 has four preamps. In my case, most of the time, four preamps is gonna be enough. I'm a drummer, I have an acoustic drum that I record once in a while. So for me, working with external preamps is a kind of a must. So the amount of input and preamps you need for your recording sessions is gonna determine if you need to, to invest into external preamps or not to start with. Then there's a matter of tone and character that you wanna to add to the signal you're recording. Yeah, do we, like these preamps, ever... you know, the preamps found on any of these interfaces uh, will sound clean, neutral, you know, without any character and color. So this is what you'll get. So here we go. Now we're getting into the claims here. And um, uh, as my tests have shown and as, as we've all shown with anybody who's actually tested this stuff, um, the, the stuff with that allegedly has character is pretty damn clean too. So I don't know. I was probably going to... You know, here's the thing. People make this claim all the time that this is character, there's this this sound, this tone to these preamps or whatever, yet they never bring numbers. And then the guys who uh, make the claim that uh, they're pretty much linear and pretty flat, like me, we actually bring numbers. We actually bring charts. We actually measure things. We run them through oscilloscopes. We run them through testing software and stuff. And when... Uh, but yet, every time somebody talks about character and tone and tells you how deaf you are if you don't hear it, they never, ever bring measurements. Have you noticed that? It, it's like, you know, when everybody's so making a claim and they tell you to take it on faith, just take it on faith. That's really uh, what's going on here. This is the, uh, like, uh, Pine Creek Doug has the uh, Mr. T saying, shut up, fool. That's that's really what they're saying is, is uh, I'm saying that this thing does this thing or it has this character or whatever. But they never bring up any evidence for it. But to me, you know, like they say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and none is forthcoming here. But I, I do like the, the sensible uh, nature of this guy's channel. He's been pretty good about uh, the technical side of things. I just I don't believe in this character and all this stuff. I mean, if it could be there, just show it. Um, you know, I was raised in this religion, and um, I really used to believe it, and. And I know how many great albums we did with this stuff, but I don't believe that it couldn't be done with the just as well with the with the stuff that they're saying doesn't have character, um, which sounds exactly the same as the stuff that they claim to have character. But anyway, let me keep going here. Yeah, which is okay. You know, there's a lot of stuff you can do in post during the mixing stage to add a bit more character to a clean oh, signal. Character uh, but this is what you're gonna get. Some will reach for external preamps for the tone, for the color, the character that it's going to oh, give you. And that you can be a big advantage. So if you look at the console that uh, I have here in the back, I only use that console for color. the preamps to record my drums on top of uh, the, you know, the four preamps that I have on my Vintech. And the cool thing about working with these preamps is that you have the input, the gain level, and you also have an output level that you can play with, which is going to allow me to add some saturation out of the preamp itself yeah, in that case, you're during actually recording, out of which is actually very range. cool. So that's by just not bringing down the output about. level, I can and, crank um, up the input. You know, if we actually go to my, go here, and when we actually look, and I mean zoomed in to like the tenth of a decibel. Um, let's just go. Uh, I mean, this is like a tenth of a decibel we're looking at here. Uh, that's a piece of crap right there. But um, here's a cheap old Behringer, flat, no distortion, not much noise. Uh, the newer Behringers, they're still just as flat. This looks not so flat because this. Um, <clears throat> 
this, uh, you know, because it's scaled in so much. But if you look, that's a tenth of a decibel. And um, it's almost a decibel down between 10K and 20K. But still, again, that's nothing. That, and the funny thing is that these are the preamps that are, because we, we did the X30, uh, the M32, the Midas as well. Uh, the actual Midas one, not the Behringer one. And it, it reads exactly like this. It's actually a little bit quieter, but the, the frequency response is the same. And so you kept hearing all these people talk about how how when you turn the Midas's up, you get this buttery, incredible flavor. But no, here you go. All the way up to three decibels. I mean, I'm cranking into this thing. It makes no distortion. It's it's the same. It's completely linear. Here's the focus rights. Here's the 18i20, super flat. Uh, Octopre Mark II, super, super flat. So anybody talking crap about these things, they are really flat. Um, Mark of the Unicorn 896. Some weird stuff when you... Uh, <laughs> Not too surprised, but uh, that of us is a little bit screwy. Um, you know, old M Audio Fast Track is pretty noisy, but um, here, here's the M32. See, and there's Neves in here. There's Amex. So, uh, yeah, man. where's that? Where's that color? Where's that character? And uh, where is it out of its linear range? Get a bit of you know tone and character and a bit of saturation uh, to the Stop signal I'm recording. That and balance that out with the output level. So this is one advantage that I have when working with a vintage type external preamp, That's like my Vintech 473. Like On the four, other hand, okay. you also have interface. So, so part of the religion was, was that, you know, amplifiers are bad. You put the, the least amount of amplifiers in a path as you possibly can, and they should all be class A, and they should all be discrete components, right? Not not all Neves were class A, by the way, and not all of them were, were discrete, by the way, but um, in this guy's case, it looks like he's got some Yamaha mixing console back there. I guarantee that's class AB, and uh, it's got amplifiers all over the place, and I guarantee, guarantee, guarantee that thing is not discrete, so this is just, like, people just hear this stuff, and they just say it, and they believe it. I believed it until I actually tested it cases like the uh, URRT4 that has a transformer that you can activate that will add this type of character to your Oh, there you go, character again. So what happened a couple shows ago where we actually checked out what the actual transformer parameters were and how incredibly hard it really is to uh, make the transformer actually not pretty much WYSIWYG past what you're putting into it. So again, this is just claims, you know, but if you're gonna bring in claims, you gotta bring evidence. Extraordinary claims need extraordinary evidence, you know? There we go again. I really believe that. Signal, and also on my main interface, the XR4, the four preamps uh, that I have on this interface has the silk uh, option, which is gonna add some character and oh, saturation God, to character. the sound. So it's giving me a similar tone than what an external. If if we gave this guy an ABX test and switch between all these things, how, how many, how many, you think he's going to get right better than chance? Really? All right, so you guys want to yell at me, yell at me. Preamp is going to give me. And there's also interfaces like UAD that will give you access to super low latency recording using preamp emulation plugins which is also very nice. As far as getting a preamp for tone, my advice is simple. I have a list of priorities when it comes to recording gear, you know, or mixing gear. Um, you know, you need to go, you need to go by priority. So, do you really need an external preamp for recording? That is a personal choice at this point. It depends on no, your the situation. Is no. the if like me, you need more input. Absolutely no. Unless you need a, a mic preamp that has more gain than you're getting off your interface, the answer is no. It's not personal, it's not whatever. You might want another preamp, but you don't definitely don't need one uh, than the one in your interface. Yeah, the answer is no. Just, just, come on, man. That's not, it's not opinion. It's, it's, if you want one, go get one, but that's, that's not need. Puts and preamps then available on your sound interface, you have your answer. If you're looking for tone only, that is a very good option if you want to improve the tone no, you know, of how, how the you sound gonna, you're okay. recording, you know, now, so that can be a very good option. Now, you just, uh, just made a claim that it's going to improve the tone. You got to bring evidence. It's, it's like, be, because so many people have said it for so long, this has become like some sort of uh, capital T truth that, that people just assume is right, but um, just because you say it a whole bunch of times doesn't mean it's true.
good option and that can also affect the way the microphone is going to sound like when working with a high quality microphone preamp it can make your microphone sound different in a good way but for tone there's always the uh, okay again i want to see proof of this i want to see proof that this guy would actually hear that it's a different mic preamp than than than, than another one i don't believe it could be i don't believe it the option of plugins. There's a bunch of preamp emulation plugins that you can work with uh, that will add that kind of character uh, to a very clean sound that you recorded with your sound interface. I'm actually going to make a video in the near future talking about some of these plugins that are actually very cool. And now, if you're new to music, let me in on, let me let you in on a developer secret from people who actually make that stuff. We exaggerate that. We go way over the top. Like there could be this perceived difference. And so we add it. You know, one of the things that people think about Neves are uh, are like you know all this all this warmth on the bottom end, right? But but what did Rupert Neves say? The big deal that he found was that one of his was tested flat out to like 50 kilohertz or whatever, or had a boost on it. And if you actually, when we measured that AMEC, what did that AMEC had? Had a pretty hefty high frequency boost, right? It wasn't flat, wasn't warm. It was boosted on the highs like all hell. So production and recording, I would say that a microphone preamp is not the first on the list of priorities. Okay, I'm going to say, make sure you have like a good interface to work with, a good computer. But again, let me, uh, let me be clear. If you, um, if you need lower noise, there, there still are some mic preamps that have slightly lower noise. Um, especially if, if you got tricked into buying an SM7, SM7B, SM7B. If you got tricked into buying one of those, uh, you might need a special mic preamp, but uh, just like that other video showed, probably not. Even with the Behringer, it was better off than with the cloud lifter thing. So, um, but yeah, um, I know that that, what's that, the one that's here? Uh, I'm gonna take this, this Bren Averill thing I got here. It has like a ton of gain. I can crank up this um, this RE20 or a, or a um, SM7, no problem. Computer and invest in your skills to start with and yes. then go down the priority list of equipment you can invest in that will improve your sound but before then i would not suggest you to invest into a microphone preamp but if you have more experience producing and recording and you already have a good interface a good microphones isn't that funny the more inner more experience you have to the point where in any other industry you would have hopefully gotten out of the placebo right well I guess there's chiropractors out there but um in in most industries the more experience you have hopefully the less the less you're gonna allow quackery right you would you would know it so it's funny that the guys with the more experience are the ones who buy the expensive microphone preamps that they don't need so you know either I'm either they're wrong or I'm very wrong because that's uh that's that's uh I'm, I'm at odds with most everybody in the industry aren't I but um Unlike them, I, I can back it up with numbers. Um, I can back it up with tests. And I dropped a spoke on the ground and I'm never gonna see it again in here. So, what in the world? Uh oh, let me go on here. And you wanna improve your sound somehow. Yeah, maybe a good high quality external mic preamp. Okay, again, man, you're making these claims. How is that gonna improve your sound? What does it do? If, if your mic preamp's already flat, are you going to make it flatter or do you mean improve it like this AMEC where they boost the treble um, to where it wasn't wasn't at before where you actually artificially turn up the treble maybe maybe you don't want to turn up the treble right there what do you mean by better less distortion show me that the, any of these things you got have less distortion um, it, it's true they could but I doubt the ones you do have so let's see <laughs> will do the trick. So those are my thoughts on working with external preamps. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, share and like. And if you're new here on the channel, feel free to subscribe to the channel and to click the notification bell so you don't miss anything. I'm probably gonna watch more of this guy's videos. It's pretty cool. Um, this one right here, expensive pickups and a cheap guitar. Is it worth it? So I'm just gonna say right off the bat, um, when you're talking about an electric guitar, your sound is the pickups. You know, I mean, you guys, you know, an electric guitar is a motor, right? I know you guys believe in tone wood or whatever, but even if you do, um, you're still, most of your most of your tone is your pickup, right? So cheap, expensive pickups and a cheap guitar. What does cheap guitar mean? Like, um, 
like those guitars that World Music Instruments in Korea makes, they, they make some for ESP and they make some for Rondo or Agile or whatever. I mean, are, is one of those cheap, even though if they're made exactly the same? Um, I love my Agiles. What does cheap even mean? But let's just see. I'm, I'm going to say that uh, expensive pickups, I don't know if the pick, pickups got to be expensive, but, you know, the pickups you like, if you like the sound of the pickups and you put it in a cheap guitar, unless something is grossly broken, it's going to sound exactly the same as if you put it in an expensive guitar. There is no difference. So let's see what these guys have to say. But, you know, I'm, I'm just going by the laws of physics and uh, electronics here. So here's the question. If we have a really cheap guitar, can we transform that guitar by putting some really expensive pickups in it? Is that alone going to be enough to turn an average guitar into something amazing? Well, wait, wait. So are we talking about sounds amazing or plays amazing? If we're talking about sound, what all parameters do you really have when it comes to an, an electric guitar? You got the scale length? Possibly. Uh, that's I, I know you guys are going to debate that one, but but possibly a scale length, right? And then the other part is um, is the pickups, right? I mean, what else is there? So where you put the pickup? Okay, that's going to make a difference. That how far away from use mostly the neck ones. If you got a twenty four fret or whatever, um, like Scott Grove kind of showed that that even that is a little bit of a misunderstanding, but but not really, uh, not too much. But um, what what else is there? What what else is, is it about a, a, a cheap or expensive guitar that makes it a cheap or expensive guitar? Besides the, uh, I mean, uh, sound-wise. I mean, I, of course, you know, I scallop my guitars, right? That That's not cheap, um, if, if I were to have somebody else do it anyway. Um, I like certain, I like neck-through bodies. That's not cheap, right? Um, but a lot of you guys with their guitars that you love the tone of, they're, they're bolt-ons. So, I don't know. I mean... What else is it going to do? But th it seems like there's a little bit of a straw man going on here because he's also saying, is it going to be an amazing guitar? Well, well, maybe it plays like crap, you know? So, yeah, just changing the pickups on it, it's not going to help it not play like crap, right? You might like the sound of it more, though. Hey, everyone. Dan here. Uh, welcome to the vlog. Okay. Really cheap guitar with really expensive pickups. This is a guitar I bought for my daughter. Uh, a couple of Christmases ago. It looks like a telly. It's a Did you steal your guitar from your daughter, dude? Come on. It's a Squire uh, telly, Affinity Telecaster, I think they call it. Um, not expensive, it's like sub 200 pounds. And it's, I mean, it's fine. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna try and be as methodical about this as I possibly can. Okay, I do have my massive pedal board which consists of a Keely modded blues driver. And that's only there to add a little bit of um, gain uh, for a couple of the sounds. But the settings will remain exactly the same. Okay, apart from that, it is going directly into a deluxe reverb. To get started uh, with the original pickups in the guitar, um, I've done as much as I can to get these as balanced as possible. Okay, so bridge pickup. Neck pickup. So the balance between them is off for me. The neck is very dark, the bridge is uber bright. So I'll just play for a bit and we'll hear some tones from the original pickups, then we'll do the pickup swap and we'll see what the new ones sound like.
Okay. Okay, I've managed to borrow a set of Ron Ellis pickups for this. Um, Ron has loaned me a 60T bridge and a Julian Lage neck um, while he's rewinding a vintage set of pickups for me. Okay, so taking pickups out of a Telecaster, it's always a bit of a mare. Um, this is a top loading bridge. You'll see the strings go through the bridge and not through the body. It does make it a bit easier, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's always a bit fiddly. Um, when we get the bridge pickup out, you'll see, boy, that's a hairy arm. You, uh, you'll see that there's a magnet that goes along the base of the pickup. Um, and that's unusual because normally each pole piece is a magnet. Oh, uh, and, the, and the coil wraps around that, but not in this case. It's more like a P90 construction where you've got steel pole pieces and just the you know, bridge. We'll take a DC resistance measurement, which is 7.56. That's a really nice place for a um, so vintage-style bridge. Okay, 5.95 measurement for the Julian Lage neck. That's low. When you're taking a DC measurement, um, if you're measuring between two types of the same pickup, you know you can fairly confidently say that you know the higher the DC resistance, the, the more output it's going to be. But really, that output is determined by the number of turns on the coil and the sort of magnets you're using, that sort of thing. Okay, let's get it back together, and we'll see um, I'm sorry, what I we've thought got. This video, I thought both of these videos would be a lot more controversial. Okay, so this is just And it's quite remarkable. So, you know, what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, a coil of wire's ability to create voltage, okay? And the differences between the two, you've got this, there's a different um, dynamic element there. This is boring. Okay, and so, actually, I, I like that he's talking about pickups. I like that he's got a picture of a manly Vox box on his, uh, on his computer screen there. Uh, there was another one that somebody was... What What the hell was it? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Sorry. Um. You know, it's funny that you get like 15 of this of these uh, channels. They're all saying the exact same thing. I've never seen this guy before. Who's this? Everything music and recording. You guys seen this? Do you need external mic? It's got a. It's got a. Uh, of course, it's got a. Uh, a surprise face with the beard, so it must be legit. Oh, he's got a nose ring too. So let's find out. Freeze, or is your audio interface good enough? All right, so this week we're answering a viewer question from Mike Hilbin. And also, if you're looking to learn music theory or improve your guitar playing, Mike's got a really great channel on that. He's pretty new to YouTube as well, so I'm going to leave a link to his channel below, so check it out after this. Bella Megatron. Do as I command! Okay, okay, jeez. But the gist of Mike's question is, do you really need an external mic preamp, or are the preamps in your uh, audio interface good enough? Is an external preamp going to help improve your recordings? So this is actually a pretty... Let me make a prediction right here. If he says that they're they're good enough, um, uh, I, I don't know. If he says they're good enough, fine. If he says that it's going to improve by using another one, I'm going to predict that he's not going to tell you how it would improve. How about that? Is that a is that a safe prediction? I don't know. This doesn't really look like a cheese channel, but <clears throat> we'll see. And I don't think he's going to bring any evidence if he does say that you need a different one. Difficult question to answer, so uh, let's start unpacking no, this. So whether or not you actually need external mic pre's is sort of a yes, no, it depends sort of question. Now I think among really. people who are new to recording, I think a lot of them have this misconception that a really good preamp is going to completely change their recordings, which really it, it's not. Now, I mean, don't get me wrong, a good mic preamp is always great to have. 
but at the same time, a good mic pre is just one component amongst a number of components that are gonna make your sound. So in order to kind of best explain where a preamp would fit into the mix, let's travel back into time. We'll go back to the days long before Pro Tools, Logic, and Computers, just to give you an idea of where the preamp sort of sits in the mix here. So for sake of argument, we're gonna pretend we got a 24 channel inline console feeding a 24 channel tape machine. Now let's say you've got a really great acoustic guitar player playing in a really nice sounding room. So there's components one and two. We got a really good guitar player and a really good sounding room. And I guess three would be a really good sounding guitar. So now you stick a really good microphone in front of that. Now that signal is going to come into the mic pre on the console, which along with the microphone and how you position it on the guitar is going to change the sound of the guitar a little bit. Mic pre is going to add a little bit of its own color to it. Is it really? Is it really? There we go. So, you know, one of the things that uh, if you guys don't know, um, way back in the day, when you had that console, you just used whatever preamps it had on it. I mean, you know, the, the people like the Neves because, uh, you know, they like the Neves. People like the Tridents, people like the APIs. It wasn't about it's the sound of the mic preamp or whatever. You, you barely ever had guys walking around with mic preamps back then. Uh, you, 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 you did from time to time, but um, they just used whatever mic preamps were on the board and they were happy with it. And, uh, you know, you can, it's so sad that Rupert Neve just died, but he would give talks where you, you could hear about how the, the noise was on these things, why he did the things he did. Um, it wasn't because they wanted to color the stuff, they wanted the stuff flat. They wanted a straight wire with gain. But anyway, let's go on. Now from the mic pre, that guitar signal is going to come down the channel strip. It's going to hit an EQ, potentially a compressor. So two more items that are going to change the way the guitar sounds. Now that signal is going to be fed over to the tape machine, which depending on how hard you're hitting the tape machine, that's also going to change the sound of the guitar. Now coming back from the tape machine back into the console, we might be EQing that guitar a little bit more, maybe adding a little bit more compression. Again, continuing to change the guitar sound. Now again, for sake of argument, let's pretend on top of this guitar track, you've recorded a couple extra guitar tracks. Maybe you've tracked some bass, you've tracked some drums, and you've tracked some vocals all through the same process. So now on the console, you're gonna have your guitar tracks go to one bus. You're gonna have your drums go to another bus, bass vocals to their own buses. So the way that that console sums these tracks together in the buses, that's gonna have an effect on the sound. Uh, and now when all your buses are summed together to come out the main output. That's another claim, right? How many times have we heard that claim? And yet that's just another one where when you ABX them, they can't tell, even though uh, those, those those summing mixers are a killer industry right now. But the master bus, that's gonna change the sound, especially if you're using a bus compressor or anything like that. And then that signal would eventually hit a two track tape machine. So that two track tape machine is gonna change the sound. And then that two track tape is gonna be sent off to be mastered, which again, is gonna continue to change the sound. Now, even if you take the tape machine and replace it with a Pro Tools rig, the process is pretty much the same. Except Pro Tools isn't really going to change the sound. It's not designed to do that unless you're throwing plugins on it. So when you look at it that way, yes, a good preamp is always important, but it's just one component amongst a number of components that are going to affect how your recording sound. All right, right so, so that wasn't the question. So uh, if you, in order for this to be the answer to the question your friend asked, um, you would have to show why the ones on his interface aren't good preamps because yes good preamps are important but what's on a, an audio interface today is is good i mean they're good by any standard not just by you know how what they cost or whatever they're just good period so oh man i'm so bad at lacing wheels sorry here we go if we fast forward to today, modern home studios, modern audio interfaces, even inexpensive audio faces in today's standards actually sound really good. The preamps are designed to be as clean, as transparent as possible. The DA converters are worlds above what they were even 15, 10 years ago. So in that respect, we're kind of living in a golden age where we've never had it so good for so little money. Now that's not to say having a really great preamp or two, you know, say Neves or APIs or some universal audio preamps isn't a good thing to have, but there's sort of an upgrading priority order that you have to think about. Now you have to remember that everything like starts at the video. source. So if you have a drum kit, heads are beat to hell, cymbals are all cracked and banged up, <laughs> and the loudest part of your drum kit is that ridiculously squeaky kick drum pedal that you've got. Well, if you take that kit and put it in a fantastic drum room in a big studio, slap $50,000 worth of microphones on it and track it through a gorgeous Neve console, well, guess what? So it's still gonna sound like shit because the drum kit itself is shit. 
So when you're putting your studio together, you always want to make sure that your sources sound really good. Your instruments sound really good. You want to make sure that the room that you're tracking them in sounds as good as you can get it. You also want to make sure that you've got a pretty good grasp on mixing and recording. Because if you don't know what you're doing with this expensive gear, well, then it really doesn't matter because you're not going to get the best and out of it. So that would be my recommendation to anybody SSL watching. Make sure your sources everything. are good. Make sure your room sounds as good then. as you can get it. And make sure that your recording and mixing skills are starting to come together. Get those areas taken care of, and then that's when you'd probably want to start looking into nicer microphones and nicer mic preamps. And All right, is, so hopefully is, I explain that in a way that makes... nicer mic preamp? What does this thing do that makes it nicer? Makes sense to everybody watching. If you have any further questions, just leave a comment below. And again, don't forget to check out Mike's channel. I'll have a link. Uh, look, see, look at them all. Do I need a mic preamp? You know, Sound on Sound is the one who did the definitive test where they just absolutely smoked... Um, you know, all these claims because they, they did, well, they tested all these mic preamps together and none of these cork sniffers could tell the difference between them. They ended up picking like an Art and a Mackie or something. But I heard that Sound on Sound's been doing some pseudoscience lately. I'm not sure. I, I They were great every time I ever looked, but we'll take a look. But here's a usual suspect like right here. Do I need a separate mic pre? Let's see what he has to say. Hello, everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. We're big, bad, and back with another Fact Friday and a lovely giveaway. So I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe, happy, and above all, healthy. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button down there. And of course you can go to Produce Like a Pro and sign up for the email list. But let's get started with the rather amazingly good giveaway. Those of you that watch the channel regularly will know that we go to AES, we go to, we pretty much go to every uh, decided to start BAW because it has Bluetooth connect. Oh, that he can go and walk out in. Imagine if you could just open that up for eight decibels. So basically a really high SBL, meaning I wouldn't touch. All the little things really help. Okay, so it's a design. This is the OC818. This is the is there oh, we also have and love the Steinberg. Now a new tape emulation. Saturation, waves have got five, haven't they? They've got three, the MDX one, they've got the, the saturation. Yeah, they've got five different brand new saturators. We the answer to your question is, how do you want to record? Are you somebody that wants to go into a great plugin running while you're tracking? If there's probably work around it, that's what's scary. I could probably come up with Given some time, a really beautiful template, and maybe a summing unit. Cranbourne springs to mind, really great stuff. And figure out a way that- I'm sorry. Let's just get back to reality here. Let's, let's see what Sound on Sound says, because I, I heard some scary things about Sound on Sound lately, but- Hello, Sound Sound. I'm Sam Ingalls. I'm the editor- If you remember, Sound on Sound was the first magazine who had the balls, so if you look way back in Reaper history, um, you know, we, we thought the magazines were going to review it. And um, when they say review, they mean you may be paying for advertising. You may be, I've heard straight up paying for reviews before, but um, we didn't pay for a review. And so Reaper never got a review, right? But, um, all of a sudden, Sound on Sound just said, hey, I'm doing it. And when they did that, when Sound on Sound did their review, that instantly made everybody else have to do a review or else they were going to look like they were not with it. And that's pretty funny. Uh, so that was pretty cool. That's, I'll always be really grateful to Sound on Sound about that. So. Editor-in-chief of Sound on Sound magazine, and I get asked a lot of questions. A lot of those questions begin with the same words, do I need, do I need to go to the shops? Do I need a shower? But most of all, I get asked things like, do I need a mic preamp? And if you're asking that question, what you probably mean is, at the moment, I'm just plugging my mic straight into my audio interface. But people on the internet keep saying, dude, that's not pro. If you want to get pro sound, you've got to get yourself a fancy outboard mic preamp and plug your mics into that instead. So, do you need a mic preamp? Well, maybe. 
There are three basic reasons why you might want to add a mic preamp to an existing setup. The first one is simple. You simply haven't got enough mic preamps. There you go. Let's say you want to record a drum kit. Your audio interface only has two mic preamps built into it. You're going to need more mic preamps. You're probably going to need more interface. The second that's, reason... That's, wait, that's, it's not as simple as that unless you have like um, a, a, an interface with the ton of line inputs, right? And, and those are actually very few of those anymore. Um, you might have an interface that has a bunch of ADAT inputs, which is why I keep making those articles about, you know, eight, eight channel mic preamps to ADAT, uh, or maybe there's some other format one of these days, but, um, yeah, it's not, it's not just as simple as, Hey, I'm going to go get more mic preamps and plug them into my, my interface that doesn't have any more inputs anyway. And, and how many actual input output streams does it present to the computer? You know, a lot of times... There's a lot of scammy stuff out there where it looks like it's a mixer with a whole bunch of inputs and uh, and it says it's got USB so you can plug it into your computer and it turns out it's really only got two inputs to the computer. So, As if the preamps in your audio interface aren't quite up to the job. You want to record the sound of a field mouse scratching its knees, you're getting a vanishingly quiet signal into your DAW, you've got the gain turned up full, you've got nowhere to go. And the third reason? is for the sound. You want to add an outboard mic preamp to get that liquid 3D solid full empty thesaurus busting magical sound that some <laughs> mic preamps are supposed to have. So I, I hope that you know like you just said thesaurus busting and he's right you know because that's what it is. It's a bunch of hyperbole and uh, what do you think? You think this guy's gonna actually say that uh, you know I mean let, let me uh, let me show you why I had the, the faith in sound on sound. I'm um, sorry, I'm really screwed up on one spoke here. Okay, that's the one. Okay, um, so if we go to sound on sound, sound on sound, mic preamp test. Um, so these two, pick a preamp and postmortem. Um, you know, they, they go and test a whole ton of mic preamps and they, they, they give it to the cork sniffers and say, hey, pick which one you like the best. And they end up picking like Mackie's or whatever. Um, where's the, there's answers in here somewhere. Um, so there's, here's a preamp result and analysis. Um, so they, they really like the, uh, the Art Pro MPA2, uh, the Neve, Mackie, um, this other one, they ended up picking the, the art again. Neve's up there, SSL. API's down at the bottom. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. Um, so this is, you know, this is why I like Sound on Sound. They, they're not afraid to, they're not afraid to do it, you know. Sound on Sound, fine test. So anyway, so let's see what he says. Do you need a mic preamp? Three basic reasons why you might want to add a mic preamp to an existing recording setup. And out of those three reasons, only the first one is really completely cut and dried. If you want to record more microphones simultaneously than you have mic preamps, then yes, you are going to need more mic preamps. And the question then becomes not, do I need a mic preamp, but how can I add a mic preamp yeah, to my existing setup? I guess I didn't the answer to, to that. that question is going to come down to what expandability options are offered by your audio interface. And usually that means digital inputs. Yeah. If you have a digital input in the SPDIF format, that can take either a single channel or a two channel output from a mic preamp that has an SPDIF output. If you have an ADAT optical input on your audio interface, you can actually get up to eight channels of extra mic preamps using something called an ADAT expander. If your audio interface doesn't have any expansion options, it's time for a new audio interface <laughs> or a smaller drum kit. So that's the first reason why you might want to add a mic preamp to an existing recording setup. What about the second one? You're recording speech or acoustic guitar or the sound of moss trembling. You've got the gain turned all the way up on your interface preamps and you're still getting a feeble signal level into your DAW. Can you matter? fix that by buying another mic preamp? Well, yes, you can. But before you do, it might be worth asking whether you really need to. Yeah, because the signal to noise about. ratio in something like speech is probably only around 40 decibels. 
and the dynamic range on the inputs on your audio interface is going to be at least 100 dB. So from that point of view, it actually doesn't really matter whether your signal peaks at minus 10 dBFS, minus 20 or even minus 40. All you need to do is record it and then turn it up afterwards in your DAW yep. and it will be exactly the same signal with exactly the same noise floor. So from a purely technical point of view, low signal levels aren't necessarily a problem in 24-bit recording. From a practical point of view, however, they can be a bit of a pain in the arse. And psychologically. So it can be very well worthwhile buying an external mic preamp. And the simplest way to fix low signal levels is to get one of those inline booster preamps that sits between the microphone right. and your existing preamp in your audio interface. Right. These typically add 20 or 25 dB of fixed gain, right. and they help to get the signal up to that healthy level where you see nice big waveforms in your DAW. But you can also choose to buy an external mic preamp. No, 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 no. So, uh, you are adding amplifiers, you are adding noise, and uh, uh, when we actually tested this one, right, it did turn out that you were still better off. Um, it, there was this idea that the last, like, quarter of your, of your gain, like when you're almost all the way up on your mic preamp, um, was a lot more noisy than the rest of it, but, but we tested that, and... Uh, Seemed like everything was pretty linear about the, the signal to noise. It didn't actually become non-linear. And um, in that case, putting one of these uh, cathedral pipes or cloud lifters or whatever, you're actually making your signal noisier than, than not using it. So, um, And attach it to the digital input on your audio interface. Yes. But how do you know it's going to be better than the preamps in your audio interface. Measure them. Well, to find that out, you need to consult the specs. Two specs are key here. One is the gain range in decibels. The other one is the maximum input level in dBU. And if you subtract the gain range from the maximum input level, then you now know the quietest signal level that will trigger a full-scale deflection going into your DAW. So if, for example, the so preamps in your lie. audio interface have a gain range of 50 dB and a maximum input level of plus 10 dBU, an external mic preamp with a gain range of 60 dB might actually be less suitable if it also has a maximum input level of plus 24 dBU. So choose carefully. So the first two reasons for buying a mic preamp are actually pretty boring. What about the third one? Will buying a mic preamp make your music sound better? Well, what it probably won't give you is significantly lower distortion or a flatter frequency response than the preamps that are in your audio interface. It won't put your drummer into time, it won't make the sing in tune, it won't address your questionable production decisions about the melodica part. But what it might do is give you more distortion than the preamps in your audio interface. And that's what people are talking about when they talk about mic preamps having a sound. Pretty much any mic preamp, if you operate it within its comfort zone, will sound the same. Right. When people talk about mic preamps having a character or a sound, they're talking about operating them outside of their comfort zone. That's something you can't do with the preamps on your audio interface, and if you could, it would sound terrible. So to push a mic preamp out of its comfort zone and get that lovely richness and harmonic saturation, we often need to apply more gain than we strictly need to get the signal up to the right level. When we do that, we overdrive the mic preamp, and if it's the right sort of mic preamp and we've done it in the right way, we'll get that pleasing effect. If it's the wrong sort of mic preamp or we've done it in the wrong way, it'll sound frankly disgusting. But the issue with doing this is that we often end up with a signal coming out of the mic preamp that's actually too hot for the inputs on our audio interface. So what we need is a way of controlling the output level from the mic preamp as well as the input level. For this reason, it can be very useful to have a preamp that doesn't only have an input gain control, but also has an output level control, or a fader sure or attenuator as it's sometimes so called. Not all outboard mic preamps have these, so it's a feature that you definitely want to look out for if you're buying a preamp purely for its sound. How much difference does it make? Well, if you push it too far, you'll turn your preamp into a fuzz box, and that's definitely not pro. If you're too conservative, you may well not really notice any difference at all compared with the preamp that was in your audio interface already. 
but if you get it exactly right, there certainly is a sweet spot. If everything in the signal chain is right, you've got the right mic pointing at the right instrument in the right room, being played by the right person, then yes, this can certainly be a good reason to add a mic preamp to an existing setup and help you get closer to the sort of sound that professional engineers are getting from day to day. So I hope this video has helped you answer the question, do I need a mic preamp? And if the answer to that question for you is yes, the next question is, which mic preamp? To find the answer to that question, you need to read Sound on Sound magazine. Every month, 